if we take more relaxed approach and call an artificial intelligence system, basically consider rule-based AIs as AIs, which is a fair point, then we pretty much have had musical AIs since at least the times of Mozart, maybe even before that. They had a game called Musical Dice, in which you had a sheet of music with lots of different phrases, musical phrases written on it. They were numbered, and then you would throw the dice, dice several times, write down the numbers you got, and play the phrases in that order. There's even wow. a very uh, a new, well, one of the most famous uh, uh, pieces in that form is Terry Riley's In C, which I I'm actually don't remember how many phrases it has there, but that's the same idea. You can follow any pattern and it will generate a different set piece of music. So it was kind of random sequencing. They, yeah, they were it's, trying... it's random wow. sequencing, but it's still gener generates you something. So yeah. Hi, folks. My name is Zuri, and here we're going to deep dive into the world of AI applications in different fields with industry experts. By the way, if you're interested in joining an engaging and professional community of IT specialists, so you should check Anywhere Club. That's the place when you can learn new skills, read captivating articles on artificial intelligence, and even get some tips from the staffing specialists. Probably they would be very useful in your further career steps. So, sounds good, doesn't it? AW.club. Today, we're going to explore the world of AI in music. So we're going to talk about the generative music with Des Christoph, a software engineer from Endel. Endel, this is an app which is generates music based on the listener's environment. So hi, Des. Thanks so hi much there. for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. I would like to start with definition, probably. Mm -hmm. I think historically, we used to think that the music is a product of musical instruments, right? But right now, it's not quite like that. Could you please make a definition of music for us? Music is such a bro broad set of uh, different, well, I guess, I, I guess you could say languages, that uh, trying to fit it into one theoretical box of what music is, is a bit uh, reductive. So I guess the closest we come is a music as organized silence. So with the idea that it's all about uh, some organization in terms of sound. And quite often it's not even about the sounds itself, but the silences between them, like which convey the rhythm. Yeah, I never thought of this. This is a music is a kind of process of managing the silence. Wow. And what about the repetitiveness? So to my mind is a kind of like the most important part, which is very uh, like blissful for our ears. This is like repetitiveness. If music should be repetitive. Well, by definition, what we perceive as sounds, even as like discrete continuous tones are repeating sounds. So any sound that you can perceive as like having a strong continuous tone, like, I don't know, like someone just bowing a string on a violin, that's already a repeating waveform. Like, it's pretty much like a bit like a sine wave, imagine that. Like, even if, if you look at the waveform, it's going to be like, it's a bit like triangly, sort of three, but still sine wave at the, the same time. Uh, and, and there's repetition in that. On the other hand, even to perceive rhythm, we're still expect some re re repeating pulse, some steady pulse that kind of tells us what's going to ha be happening next, like when the next beat is going to be. Obviously, there's genres of music that kind of stray away from that, that try and either change the rhythmical grids with uh, music like jazz and all sorts New of like jazz. math rock. Yeah, New yeah, jazz, exactly. but I was good, as a counterpoint, we have free jazz, which they kind of 
stay away from a set rhythmical structure and kind of more come and go together and uh, it's quite a different genre but at the same time there's still lots of uh pulse in there it's just switching it's not constant it's it might even have two pulses at the same time that not aligning it's quite interesting let's talk a little bit about data I mean, uh, here it is, we're going to talk about the AI in different industries and about generative music. But before switching to this part, I think this is a kind of very important to talk about data itself. So could you please explain how music is described and analyzed as data? I guess we could go the historical way. So historically, we didn't really think about uh, music theory in a way, in a like a certain concrete way. It was more about like, okay, I plug that string, I got that sound. If I plug the other one, I got a different sound, and that's it. Like most of music was mo monophonic, so it's like just one melody line, one note at a time. But then someone came up with a great idea: of what if we play two instruments at the same time? And suddenly you have relationships between the notes and they have to be pleasing, like they have to sound good. And so, and suddenly we have that question and we're like, okay, so what do we do now? Like, how do we make these two instruments sound good together? And that's how we pretty much started coming up with music theory. Obviously that's not like a concrete discovery that we have like historical documents proving it, but a lot of the first music theory works were done by ancient Greek philosophers. Pythagoras did lots of work on tuning systems, so actually making instruments like tuned to the same note steadily. So we started with that. I like that approach I would call the top-down approach, since we start thinking with purely conceptual terms like notes, chords, uh, rhythms, and uh, then we start we, well, historically would take those th theoretical terms and then apply them to a, an instrument and perform the music. So lots of music has been written down, stored in a conceptual way as sequences of notes. And then in the late 19th, early 20th century, we, came, we got recorded music. Suddenly we could record the resulting waveform. So instead of coming up with concepts, applying them to a musical instruments and getting the music we could just get like either wax cylinder later we could get uh, vinyl plays then we could get uh, tapes and now we get mp3s and stuff of just the resulting waveform and just play it back and hear it again so even the perception of music became different. So you mean from the conceptual point of view, when we're yeah. talking about notes, when we're talking about the rhymes and things like that, yep. but yep. we have another angle of yeah. looking at the I'm, data. I'm actually ex music. getting exactly to that, to that. That angle is tied to recording, to, to our ability to actually capture sounds. Since as soon as we have captured the sound, can reproduce it, then that means we can analyze it. Fast forward, we uh, get computers, we can actually store audio as digital data now, which gives us options as, I don't know, as, as AI system developers, as ML researchers to actually train neural networks on that data, on, not on node sheets, but on actual waveform data. And that's, that's what I would call a, a bottom-up approach. So we get a waveform and then quite often we try to understand, okay, what was happening inside this waveform? Like by analysis, by labeling, by anything. So here we're talking about more like physical attributes, like, like the yeah. wavelength, frequency, and things yeah. like that. This is very interesting. So we have like two completely different ways to describe music, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, from top-down approach and bottom-up approach, as you said. And let's imagine that we have I would even two say, uh, sorry uh -huh. to interrupt you, but you can even sure. do a top-down top approach, but just start from a lower level. So, instead of mm. describing the piece of music from a music theorist's point of view, 
you describe it from an arranger's point of view. So you describe, okay, you can hear this, that, and that instrument. So you kind of like separate them. For a regular listener, you don't even know what instruments are playing. You just describe vibes. And, Emotions, uh, I would say. Yeah. And uh, that's that's basically a very interesting approach when we go to uh, a very interesting question when we go to music, uh, uh, well, language models and just well, not actually language models, but basically music uh, generate uh, generation AIs. Let's imagine that we have like two data sets, like the mm -hmm. same music written, but we have like the two ways of description. Like the first mm -hmm. one is conceptual one, when we have notes, rhymes, and things like that. And we have data sets where the data uh, is described in this way. Like the second data set uh, will be described in the opposite way, like bottom-up approach. So we will mark the, the frequency, uh, wavelength, and things like that. So, and we, after that, we will train our model based on mm -hmm. this data. So let's just imagine, at the, which is very interesting to me, what kind of limitations would have each of this uh, neural network trained on the first approach and trained on the second approach? And maybe what kind of advantages would they have over each other? The ideal scenario, if both data sets actually contain the whole stack of, no, of information. So let's say we have the top-down approach that we describe notes, but for each note, we actually have a description of the musical instrument used. And for that musical instrument, we have description for properties like, um, I don't know, like note velocity, something like that. Even waveform data, like connecting it to a, a certain waveform data, then it would be able to generate but like anything. Same thing with the bottom up approach. You get a ton of waveform fi files, and for each one, uh, you basically described it all the way, but from the bottom up. So you describe, okay, this sounds bassy or rhythmic or whatever. Then you describe, okay, so th this sounds like that. These are the instruments involved. These are the notes they're playing. This is the key they're playing in. Mm -hmm. So you start from the bottom and just go up. So if you both the these data sets cover all the same information, you'll be able to actually get similar results. Problem is that we don't have that uh, data set that deep. Getting it will be probably uh, prohibitively expensive. Just labeling all that data would be this a is nightmare. manual labeling. You, uh, you mean this should be made manual? There are no automated like or hybrid. The approaches depends. For it. That's the, it depends. Like none of those approach approaches are perfect. None of those approaches are accurate enough. Sometimes even we can't, uh, even the theoretical ba uh, apparatus that we use to reason about music can't actually describe something. Because I don't know, like even with, if we take like Western musical tradition, we'll have 12 tones per, uh, per octave. If we go into Indian music, they have 24 tones per octave, like twice as much. And if you try and use our 12 tone scale to describe what Indian music is doing, you'll fail miserably. You won't be able to just bec because you don't have the conceptual apparatus for it. Technically, you could... Vocabulary. You're using yeah, different yeah. vocabulary for yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, there are workarounds nowadays with, mm -hmm. like, half sharps, half flats, which is, like, what normally have... So, with normal music notation, uh, for each note, we divide uh, an octave, like, which is a frequency interval, into 12 semitones. And uh, basically, when we say a certain note, we describe its frequency. And when we specify whether it's sharp or flat, that's basically moving the frequency from the natural tone of the note, a semitone up or a semitone down, right? And so yeah. if we want to do a quarter tone, which would give us the Indian thing, we, uh, the Indian 24 tone scale, we can do half sharp and half uh, flat, which will respectively give us quarter tone up, quarter tone down. But that it's still a workaround. This is like a new addition to try, trying to use an old system, not fitted for, for that kind of music, to kind of like support it and accept it. Like it's still a fairly decent system. We still use it and it's like the de facto standard, but that it still has limitations. 
So yeah, from that even theoretical uh, point of view, getting a concrete and single source of truth about a certain musical piece might be impossible because even then your theoretical apparatus might just not support it. And we don't have a theoretical apparatus to describe all the music that we have. Do you mean that there is no like definitive approach to describe the same sound? Sometimes, yes, because wow. uh, yeah, even um, a good example is, uh, you know, um, Dreams by Fleet Fleetwood Mac. Yep. So there's still no con concrete decision which scale it is in, because you can reason about uh, its musical scale and musical key quite differently. And depending on how you look at it, it's in different keys or different scales. <gasps> Mm -hmm. You mean the same sound should uh, can be, can be represented major so. and can be uh, like the different note minor, for example, yeah. right? Yeah, here oh. it's a Lydian and I think in a major scale, so in mm -hmm. a minor scale. So it depends on how you look at the, look at like the chords. It suggests like a Lydian scale. If you look at the melody, it's more like a minor scale. So even and that's even a Western music piece so it's not even something that the western musical theory apparatus is, is not fit to describe it just falls in between the rules and can be both and you know what uh, the question which just came to my mind when we were talking about these two different approaches uh, top down and bottom up uh you talked about the recording music that the uh when we started recording music it changed our perception on the music and the way we're analyzing and describing this right so could you please a little bit uh dive into this thought how the recording of music changed the industry besides uh, uh, the fact that we just uh, mentioned about the bottom-up approach you can still see how it changes nowadays uh, with uh, streaming services like changing drastically the music uh, industry uh, revenue model and uh, cutting out much more money from the artist, even though at the same time providing much more access to unsigned artists, like allowing them to distribute their music much cheaper, much easier. So kind of a, 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 an interesting trade-off as well. Like this made the music even more accessible because more people can actually release it. But because at the same time, this same, uh, this same uh, step, move, switch to, st to a streaming model kind of devalued the, the price of music like before uh, like a month of any subscription costs a bit less than a decent album but this is actually what is happening with different industries right this is really reminding me of the situation with the taxi with the taxi applications yeah but right after uh, a lot of aggregators and taxi apps were released the price of the uh, of your ride decreased immediately and all of the taxi drivers are dissatisfied with that because they are they're having less money but the customers are more satisfied with that because the market itself the competition makes the price drop uh, down and do you see the same in the music that streaming services like uh, uh, made the border lower the threshold for entering the market, but still it it became much more harder to be successful, as I may say, to uh, get the bigger audience, right? It it's basically it depends on how you look at it, whether uh, where your starting point is. If you already made it into the music industry, like you're a performing musician of some sorts, you're, I don't know, playing gigs, maybe you're not making enough money back on it, like you're spending more on it than you make back, but you're making some money back. So going from that point to a big star, nowadays it's much harder than it used to be before because there's just so much more to choose. On the other hand, just getting to be a performing musician back then was much harder than nowadays. Just learning an instrument nowadays is so much easier. Just there's so many amazing services. I mean, I personally learned to play guitar and like all I know, well, not all I know about music theory, but most of it, a lot of it through YouTube videos. 
So the self, uh, the self education in music is a kind of thing that made a lot of a lot of stars mm-hmm. there, I suppose. But at the same time, the artists themselves, kind of like how taxi drivers were unhappy, the, the artists themselves are unhappy as well, because the Spotify royalty, well, Spotify streaming service royalties generally are much lower than they historically were, than they would norm- get from true normal album sales. So uh, there's lots of debate right now about a fairer model, but a con- we don't really have a consensus on it at the moment. Like, there's no idea of ever, like, there's not anyone in the market nowadays going, it's like, okay, we're changing the model, this is how we're going to do it. There's some proposals, some are good, some are bad, some are interesting. Uh, from the interesting one, let's say there's lots of people trying to apply blockchain technology to music IP rights. So you would use the blockchain to sign the ownership of the audio files and stuff like that. Kind of like audio NFTs in a way, but oh, they actually like have... contracting for music. Yes, okay. yes, mm-hmm. but I don't remember the exact details of the protocol. I think that there was some like DRM management involved, but instead of using DRM like the traditional way they were doing through the um, through the blockchain, through Ethereum, but in all fairness, I, I didn't really research too much. But about the streaming services, as we started, right? Uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify with you. As I remember, the first application of artificial intelligence uh, in music for me as a user, right? Yeah, like an ordinary user. So it was the recommendation systems in streaming services. I clearly remember the times where we were comparing different music app based on the recommendations they are providing to us. So for me, that was the first case, like the global case of using artificial intelligence and music. But am I, am I right? Or something like this was done before? Well, it really depends on your definition of artificial intelligence, really, because if we take a more relaxed approach and call an artificial intelligence and basically consider rule-based AIs as AIs, which is a fair point, then we pretty much have had musical AIs since at least the times of Mozart, maybe even before that. They had a game called Musical Dice, in which you had a sheet of music with lots of different phrases, musical phrases written on it. They were numbered, and then you would throw the dice, dice several times, write down the numbers you got, and play the phrases in that order. There's yeah. even a very uh, a new, well, one of the most famous uh, uh, pieces in that form is Terry Riley's In C which I I actually don't remember how many phrases it has there, but that's the same idea. You can follow any pattern and it will generate a different set piece of music. So it was kind of random sequencing. They they were it's it's random sequencing, but it still generates you something. So uh, some people kind of try and separate that from AI and just call it generative music in general. But in a broader sense, And I guess in the contemporary context, lots of people prefer to call that AI as well. Uh, Sorry, I forgot forgot to answer your initial question. So about the recommendation systems and streaming services, I personally don't know whether it was the ML systems, uh, some neural networks or something, or whether it was just basic algorithms. But at least in the consumer's eye, the consumer's perception, that's definitely a very bright example because lots of people because music is something we deeply care about and discovery of new music something that used to be really hard back in the day suddenly became much easier before that i was forced to find music by myself Mm -hmm. right so and it was a quite a journey yeah so from the films from last uh, last fm from all of the sources you're kind of searching and you're so happy when you found something but after streaming services started recommendating tracks so this thing just went a little bit in the past uh, so right now uh, I'm using this a lot. I really like my recommendation systems in my mm-hmm. music app. Yeah, 
but still, uh, how do you think, was it the first, I mean, practical machine learning uh, application in musical? Or have you heard of something else before, I mean, before that? I mean, it still depends on your definition. As like, as a finished product, I'm not sure. As a technology available, I mean, lots of electronic artists have been using generative techniques in their pieces for quite a while. I mean, Aphex Twin had some pieces like that where basically each live performance would be different because the algorithm that generates the music would generate it in a different way. Uh, another notable example also uh, from the UK, Autocre. Oh, actually, they're Canadian. I was thinking of... Uh, Mm -hmm. Or they're British. I'm actually consider confusing them with Bulls of Canada. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we, we've had generative approaches available for quite a while. Uh, and uh, since the advent of computers, we could actually digitize them and use them as algorithms with the computer running them instead of us having to do the calculations. And what, uh, what I'm just thinking right now, uh... How do we measure the quality of generative mu uh, generated music? What kind of metrics we use? I I are there any best practices for that? Mm, I guess uh, a good metric would be precision. So uh, whether the gener generated result matches what you what you put in. So let's say I don't know if if you have a text to music network you describe whether your prompt matches what you get. If we're talking mm -hmm. about like time bridge transfer, uh, then you kind of try to analyze the spectrum, whether it resembles the target one and uh, things like that. It's really funny because you can actually see that in the way networks are trained and uh, their deficiencies, like that not deficiencies, but I guess that quirks in a way. So, uh, really interested uh, recently was Google's um, Music ML. Yep. So the, uh, the Google generative music uh, a neural network. Yeah. So the, the, the newest release, they actually open source their data set, which mm -hmm. uh, is about fifty five or five thousand five thousand five hundred piece of music. I think more like fifty five thousand, but I I might be moving the comma a bit. Um, yeah, but still lots of uh, audio pieces with uh, descriptions. And those descriptions were provided by musicians, by trained musicians. Thing is, the way those musicians were describing being the audio was just from a point of view, okay, what instruments are playing? Like, from basically from an arranger's point of view, okay, I hear an instrument playing that, I play, hear another instrument playing that. It wasn't describing what notes were being played, what chords were being played, whether it's a single sound or several sounds. So if you try and use that neural network and tell me, uh, tell it to generate you, um, I don't know, a chord progression in A minor, it won't because it's, it wasn't trained to know what A minor is. Yeah, because a different level of... Uh, uh concept as i may say of yeah, abstract exactly right yeah yeah that's but at the same time at the same time if you're measuring it by how much it performs according to its training data then it performs really well like if you tell it to write your track with a specific instrument and in a specific i don't know drum machine you'll get something that really sounds like that like really similar maybe it'll be like oh someone's played some effects on top, so some of the hits sound weird, but it still will have the same core character of it, just because it will get the spectral characteristic of it from the audio file. And what about the guess in the genres? Which neural network train on the bottom-up or uh, top-bottom approach will be better in uh, differentiating the genres? Like, this is hip-hop, this is like new jazz, or something like that. So I guess a good first place would be to start with what kind of inf information you want to feed into it. If you... Same thing with the top-down, bottom-up approach. If you want to feed it sheet music days, like notes, and for it to tell you what genre that is, then you need mm -hmm. the top-down approach. If you mm -hmm. want to Sweet. do like Shazam and just hold it up to a speaker and... Uh, your 
uh, smartphone or wherever it's running will tell you what genre it is, then you need the bottom-up approach because what you get on input is raw audio data. Uh huh. By the way, Shazam, Shazam mm -hmm. is, is existing for so long, mm -hmm. and I never, never thought about the technology inside, about the text, how they are recognizing the music. Could you please tell us a little bit more how Shazam is working? <laughs> I think, uh, if, uh, first of all, I, I do think they have an NDA, so even if I knew, I couldn't really tell you. But uh, they do have some papers published. They do have some papers published, and uh, the core idea is that they're deconstructing the uh, input signal, trying to uh, analyze its uh, both fre frequency and, if I'm not mistaken, its... Uh, Cap so it's spectral and capstral content. Spectral is the uh, the data you can get about a uh, sound by performing a Fourier transform. So from a waveform, we get uh, the um, all the different uh, frequency components uh, for each step uh, of the waveform file. And then for, well, not for each step, for each, we kind of like split it into bins. So it's actually for each bin, but that, that's a long story. Um, but basically you can get the frequency content. And then if you analyze the frequency co content yet again, and try and squish frequencies that are uh, harmonics of each other, as in they, that frequencies are uh, share a common denominator. So let's say 400 at, at 800 would, if you go from uh, spectral to capstral, it will just get mushed into 400 because we're only counting the fundamentals. So by getting spectral analysis, you can get how it kind of sounds, whether it gets has more highs, lows, kind of try and guess which what instruments are playing, like whether that. Well, more like whether there, there is a bass playing or there's not, whether there's uh, some, you can get the rhythm, like the, uh, the tempo of the track from that data. But when you get the capstral analysis, you can actually analyze which notes are playing. Oh, and, so there are both uh, of them, not only yeah. bottom up, but still the it, top it's, bottom. It's still bottom up, but you basically just keep going up. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. Mm hmm. Uh, uh, so, and by that, they generate some kind of a sound song fingerprint, which is like a unique identifier. And basically they map used, after that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they map that and uh, how the decision, how actually they decide which is the closest, uh, uh, the closest match, how they choose the correct match. I'm actually not sure. I don't think they've posted, but it could be generally I imagine it's some kind of a weird vector, big vector database so they could even probably do it without machine learning just by analyzing the vector space but still they need to build the vector space which is yeah well yeah. for them that's easy I mean I mean the, well. the volume you can you can just uh, yeah imagine obviously the, lots of compute volume. lots of compute yeah. But uh, from getting that data set for them was fairly easy because uh, they offer themselves as a service. Okay, so you're a music uh, copyright holder and you want people to buy your music more. So you want those people to be able to discover it. So when you, they hear it somewhere, they can shazam it and find you and actually go and buy it. So. Pro, uh, IP right holders will actually approach Shazam and give them the, uh, the needed data to actually train the data set because they needed that. Well, not not train but build that data set, like because uh, it's not necessarily uh, machine learning there. And the next question which just came to my head: uh, Do you remember when uh, Dali and Stable Diffusion model were just released? Uh, yeah, yeah. Everyone was trying to generate some pictures and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we had some patterns which actually helped us to differentiate generated pictures. Amount of fingers, yeah, amount of legs, hands and things like that. So uh, 
Could you please tell us, are there any kinds of patterns in generative music which will help you to differentiate it from their manual written one? First of all, that, I guess, that applies to diffusion models. So the way, I'm actually not quite sure if Medjourn is a diffusion model, but, uh, but stable, stable diffusion, diffusion is. for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the way, uh, the way they do, they start with a noise signal and kind of filter it until it turns into the desired image. And since the noise can be random, you can, and some, like, uh, some bits, like fingers, just don't have enough data to actually train the data set in them because, because that, the data is not enough to actually build a physical model of some sort in, inside the, the like the a neural network. So we, we got artifacts like that, just because there wasn't enough information to actually learn what hands were. And we have a similar thing with the fusion models in music, like uh, uh, Harmony have a dance diffusion. Harmony is actually a part of Stability AI. Uh, so they have dance diffusion, which is the fusion model ba built for music. You can train it on your own so sounds as well. And uh, yeah, it has the same glitches, you, but it has the same glitches as in if something doesn't really exist in the data set so much that it can learn it, let's say language, then it'll generate it weirdly. So in terms of the audio diffusion models, if you generate vocals, they don't make sense. They They're sound just like mumbling, words. Just blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. it's not even mumbling. It's just like a, 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 an assortment of phonemes. Like you, you hear something that sounds like words. Actually, it's not words. Phonemes, yeah, phonemes are so difficult because when you're analyzing the, our speech, it's a kind of like the line which is not interrupting. So for me, especially, it was a kind of interesting how kids differentiate words in this long, long, long speech without any pauses. So if we're talking about phonemes, I, I, I suppose there, there is a kind of thing that it's hard to differentiate the end of one word when, when the other starts. So That's, That really depends on your analysis method. So if you're just anal analyzing a waveform, trying to guess yep. the phonemes, like if you're looking just at the waveform and not performing any transforms in it, mm -hmm. you can't really guess the phonemes. And it looks like a straight, Exactly, just, the endless Just a straight thing. line. Yeah. Just, it gets some peaks and valleys, like, you, but you don't really understand wh where one uh, phoneme, one syllable starts and a d different one ends. But if you turn it, if you apply Fourier transform and see the frequency components, you'll actually hear, well, you'll actually see big jumps in the spectrogram because where exactly the changes in pitch in uh, I don't know, like resonant frequency, if we talk about like our mouths and stuff, if we talk about like syllables and human speech. That's pretty obvious that we can differentiate the mumbling from the real speech. But what about the music? Because uh, it's completely different from speech. What can be weird in music? Uh, I mean, so there are so many genres right now which are trying to do it like, uh, uh, in a special way to do to make it weird, like um, mm -hmm. by the goal. Well, uh, so it's it all again all the glitchiness, all the weirdness. It's all about like training data and the biases in it, or like the data that's missing or is present. Maybe it gets overfitted, stuff like that. So when we talk about like like diffusion and basically bot bottom up approaches for generating oh, audio one of the first uh, milestones that were we had to, like, like researchers had to overcome was getting st stereo sound together so because it's actually two sounds that have connection to it two waveforms that have some connections between them but they're not obvious so you actually have to train all the data your whole data set set or st stereo sounds and that's much more expensive that's literally kind of like uh, quadruple because it's quadratic complexity and it's like twice as much. Yeah, it's, or even more. Anyways, um, so that was a big problem. So quite often, if you would hear an AI-generated piece, it would be mono. You won't have a stereo sound. 
recently there has been breakthroughs. We have uh, Suno AI that actually generates stereo sound. It can even generate lyrics, but uh, since they're closed source, we don't really know what's happening. So quite possibly they have uh, some kind of a diffusion model that generates the background sounds. And then they have a separate model that generates uh, lyrics, well, speech, um, renders it, and then just mixes it all together. Well, I've, actually, I was really, uh, I, I was going to ask you about the Suno AI. Or, or did you use it, or what kind of experience did you have, and what do you think about the future of such services? Definitely can't say whether they'll be a game changer. Because on one hand, uh, it's not really a product that people asked for in a way. Basically, lots of AA products at the moment kind of feel like a hammer looking for a nail. Like, we have this Whoa, amazing, amazing technology, true. let's try and do something cool with it. And then yep. we try and apply it everywhere and just smash things. <laughs> totally agree um, with you. Yeah, yeah with Suno AI... Cases. Yeah, there's still no clear use case, but the results that they're getting are actually really good. Like you can get some really good sounding pieces. A thing that, what, what really surprised me, I think I saw a Twitter post where someone asked it to generate mid 2010s uh, math core. And it got the sound, like the characteristic harmonies, the characteristic sounds very well. But it was still in 4.4, like the main characteristic of genre was gone, just because most of the data sets didn't really have that marked. That's a thing, that music is a kind of creative industry, but right now neural networks are not capable of doing something brand new, which is completely different from their training data set. So that said, how do you think if the in future we could we could get this creative component into the neural network. Even now we don't really know why we create. Like we know that we really like doing it. Like it's uh, it's innate to all human beings, but at the same time we don't know what we do, why we do it. So trying a, and coming up with a machine that has that same creative spark it's a bit hard. Like we have to understand a bit more about how it works for us to try and translate it into a different model and into a different like set of coordinates, if you if you if you want, and apply it there. What's much more possible is AI evolving and in, uh, evolving into a creative tool. Like what mm. what what we often see nowadays is uh, uh, most of the AI, AI products that are catered to and consumers. They're not catered to music makers, they're not catered to professionals, they're catered to uh, regular people. So like, oh yeah, you want something to, nice to listen to, there you go. And that's not a bad thing, obviously. There's lots of, uh, like, I mean, coming from a person uh, working for a generative uh, functional music company who literally does that, like we provide music that serves a function that helps you relax, sleep, or focus, and that's a valid use case. Thing is, uh, that functional music, and we don't really use mu music functionally historically. We connect with music emotionally. Like if you look at the top 100 songs, you won't see any ambient music there. But if you actually go to Spotify and see songs by Mount Streams. Then actually sleep music, white noises, nature noises will be quite high up just because lots of people use it and it's generally use it for eight hours and more when they sleep. So, yeah, that's still that, that basically that, that means there's a market for that. People need that kind of functional sound, I don't know, sound bad, sound wash around them. If we're talking about functional sound, uh, can we say that we're talking about like passive listening? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't even call it passive listening. It's not listening. Uh, we, we like at Handel, we joke that like if, if a person is listening to the soundscape for more than 10 seconds, then we have done a bad job. 
like they should be able to tune it out much earlier. Yeah, because you cannot concentrate on something while you're hearing the sound and switching your attention to the music. And by the way, you said that uh, you mentioned that in Endel you have like different modes like relaxing, concentrating, sleeping. And by the way, listeners, right now you can see and uh, you can hear on the background the sound of Endel music. And we will ask you, try to guess what kind of mode did we use? Maybe sleeping mode? <laughs> maybe <laughs> concentration one? Or maybe relaxing one? So looking forward to your replies and comments. And the question to you, uh, this is, could you please uh, clarify what's the difference from the bottom-up or top-bottom approach and what is more interesting, how it influenced the generative uh, approach? I can't really tell you how exactly how it's done in Endel because and uh, I'm I'm covered by uh, I basically have an NDA, but uh, what we what I can tell you that there are certain heuristics that you can analyze in sounds that kind of could help you determine whether that's suitable for that application or not. Like a good signifier would be for focus music, you uh, you generally don't want to have any ly lyrics because it's a whole. We already process music using our speech center, and that's just adding extra to it. So if you're trying to read something or write something and there's some ly ly lyrics playing, it'll be much mm -hmm. harder for you to actually concentrate on your writing or reading. Mm -hmm. um, another good thing would be high frequency sounds in the, in the evening. It's kind of similar to uh, yellow light filters on laptops and stuff where high frequency lights kind of stimulates us and makes us feel more awake. So we don't really want that in the, in the evening. There's a similar pro, similar thing with high frequency sounds. So generally, if you want something to work well for sleeping, you want to re just decrease the high end of it. So it doesn't sound that, that present. It doesn't sound that close to you. So sharp, I would say, all the sharp noises. Are yeah, you want to keep it to min minimum. So it's... It might be even related to our perception of uh, distance. Mm -hmm. So as objects are closer to us, we get much more high frequency and low frequency content. If they move away, those components start decreasing. So if something's really bright sounding, has like lots of high frequency content, we perceive it as close to us, like something happening really close to us. So maybe that's like a sense of danger. It's like, oh, something loud and bright happened. I'm, I'm in danger. But if it's muffled, it sounds as if it's far away. So you're far away from it, all far away from the danger. And there is a place for concentration here. Then, then, then closer the sound to you, then less concentrated of you would be, I suppose. But that works for me this way. With concentration might be the other way around, because you want to be in that kind of like sweet zone of like enough stimuli, but not too much stimuli. And uh, so there you kind of want bright sounds, something that kind of keeps you alert, but you don't want them too much. Like a good, a good, I don't know, recipe for like a focusing thing would be uh, a steady rhythm. So you have like a steady rhythm going, so your brain can easily predict what's going to be happening next. You want as much repetitions as possible. And you want the sounds to be, well, that's, now this is all, uh, and there you go into personal preference. So for some people, they want their sounds to sound loud, brash, like you get techno basically. Like I know lots of people who love to work to techno just because, and some really, really like aggressive, industrial, almost industrial sounding techno, because they prefer the loud sound, it keeps them alert, keeps them concentrated. For some other people, they prefer softer sounds. They listen to like, I don't know, like acoustic, acoustic music or classical music, or like there's lots of very cool neoclassical composers who use uh, minimalism and like repeating patterns that really work well for focusing. So it's basically you try to be rhythmic, no lyrics and pleasant sounds, something that kind of like it is aesthetically pleasing for you. And as we said, like in the beginning of our discussion, that repetitiveness is something very, very joyful for our ears, for our brains. 
that is certainty. Right? Well, uncertainty is something that can be risky for us. I suppose that the same with uh, with the music, yeah, because all of these repetitive, simple rhymes are much more rememberable. Uh, how can I say? It's much more catchy for us. It's yes and no. We actually want that. I don't know thrill of tension and release. So we have some repeats, and then we have something else, kind of like how you. I don't know, in music, you repeat a phrase three times and on the fourth repeat, you play something else. And then, I don't know, maybe the, fir the first time you go through these four beats, three, these four bars, you play one version of it. Then in the second one, you play a different version of it. And then the third one, you, I don't know, a third version, and then you re return to the first. Return to it's the first, yeah. Like you still build patterns, like there's still repetition, but maybe it's not as granular. Maybe you have repetition, Granite's but like wider. across longer ranges, or even sometimes like that, those patterns aren't really regular. Like a very good example would be MF Doom's right, uh, rhyming, how you have rhymes in, middle, in the middle of words even sometimes. Just because you have com a compound root word, based, and one of the roots suddenly works with the other one, and our minds still fight. Even though there's no no straight repetition there, still because there's still a pattern, there's still some regularity to it. Our minds actually find that pleasing. So yeah. But here we're talking about the author rights, right? So if you're revealing all the training data sets for your generative music neural network, so you need to reveal all the music and you need to agree with all of the musicians on this uh, uh, music author rights. And which is happening right now, we don't know what kind of data uh, neural networks are using, except open source one, like Hug and Face and things like that. So. I see this uh, as a risk, as a feasible risk, because I see that big companies are using the data, the output and the products of creative industry in order to train their data sets. And they are right now, probably, they're not willing to pay for uh, this training activities, for using such data in their training activities. And in music, this question is even sharper because uh, the authorites of music, of lyrics, there are, there are too many, uh, you know, uh, processing should be done before you will use such data in your uh, neural network. So my question is to you, how do you think if such uh, training data sets for generative, uh, uh, for music generative neural networks, is it needed? So is it fair? What, what do you think about revealing the training that it's, it's, it's the most fair thing to do. The idea is like, uh, f in terms of like big companies who are training, uh, like I don't know, like who are basically training already training on music uploaded there and stuff like that. The thing is, we don't really have a legal precedent to say that's okay. So, at the, what's gonna happen soon probably we'll have some big court case that will set the legal precedent on, on how we handle IP cases like this. But you mean so there are no best practices yet and we need some incidents which are just to Well the best practices actually license your data set. So when you go and acquire like I don't know sounds to train your data on actually be open and say okay we're gonna use this as a training data set. Clear all the rights and do that. That's and the thing is, obviously, yeah, you won't be able to get, I don't know, the most amazing quality music or something, but it really depends on what you're trying to do. It really depends on your end goal. If your idea is you want to make a machine that generates you the new hot pop song, then yeah, you need that data. You need the hot pop song data. You need to know what's happening. And even then, I don't think like with, even with pop song stuff, like uh, even if you try to like generate the most catchy thing ever, I don't think we have enough data yet to actually train it right to be able to to just make your whole track from start to finish with zero human input. Because nowadays you can probably like you can even use Suno and generate 
make a whole track. But at the same time, you, you have to come up what the track's going to be about, what's going to sound like, and you have to be the person making it. Like someone has to make it in the end. That's uh, I suppose it's for the whole AI in the industry. So we are, uh, we tend to think about a uh, neural network as an agent entity, but all the neural networks are built and all the feature set, uh, all the co data collection steps, everything are written by people with people with biases. Yeah, the people who has the assumptions and things like that. So probably as for me, that, that it's not agent yet. But by the way, Cognition AI just released Devin, as I remember the name yeah. of the uh, AI uh, developer. So how do you think, are we close to, uh, to the AI assistant in music in the same way, the musician? A musician, let's call it. We are definitely close. Like, the thing is, with more limited applications like that, uh, we can gen we can train very small, compact networks that could help people write music. Like, I don't know, um, you could uh, even get uh, basically just get uh, even a synthetic data set or some sort, like just c cover all the possibilities and just apply some rules and you can get, I don't know, like a melody generator. So you feed it chords, it generates a nice melody that goes with these chords. Problem is we don't really make anything in a moment like that. Like there's not, not, a, not a single product. Most of the, most of the stuff we get right now is synthesizing music based on previously recorded waveforms. We have stem separation, which basically you take a waveform and take out the different instruments, like isolate them so they all sound different. That's, so we already have working. that. That's actually a product, yeah. Yeah, that is already working, right? So you can get the track and, for example, say, I need only drums from this track. Yep, yep. And they will be extracted and you can yep. reuse them in your track. Isn't it yep. theft? Uh, that's that's actually a question that the music industry has been asking itself since, I don't know, maybe the 80s, since we, uh, got the first commercial samplers, as in uh, basically a hard drive with a, a player attached to it. You could record some sounds onto it, it would play them back. You could alter the pitch of the sound and the speed of playback. And basically, I don't know, you could record a sound of, I don't know, for tuba and then play the tuba on a keyboard. At the same time, this allowed some. Uh, because people could record longer samples, they could actually record whole phrases and reuse them. It kind of started even with uh, even that kind of approach to music and like grabbing phrases and reusing them is actually central to DJ culture and sound system culture. Like early DJs, uh, they would extend the breaks, the dance break of the song so people could dance longer. So they would have two decks with the same uh, with the same disc on them, with the same song playing on them, but basically they would switch between one and the other. So the, on, on, I don't know, deck A, the break, the dance break is starting, because it, it started with disco, like disco songs had dance breaks, and uh, the da dance break is starting. By the time it's playing, he primes the start time on the second one, and yep. turns it on, and, at, and turns it on and sings, so by the time, the Deck A finishes playing the loop, Deck B starts playing it. Starts, yeah. They are so, in the loop uh, together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So using mm -hmm. loops, mm -hmm. and someone got the great idea. Well, we can actually use loops of already recorded songs, and that's how sampling came to be. And lots of electronic music, lots of hip hop music uses that. I mean, there's amazing like masterpieces of albums that are extremely heavily sample based, but first of all, the music industry has decided it's not really theft. And, uh, you, but you still need, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's still complicated. Like you still need to clear the rights for sampling. You have to clear the sample, all that. You still, the artist still can deny you. Like, 
I don't know, they can say, oh, your song uses swear words and I'm like, I'm really aghast that so I don't want you to use my song. Stuff like that. And uh, so I guess stem separated sampling would apply the same way. Like you take a drum part, uh, take a, a certain musical part from a certain existing track and use it in your own. You'll probably just would have to go to the original artist and go like, or whoever the the IP rights holder is, and saying like, okay, so I'm, I wrote my song, I use a sample from yours. Is that okay? Sharing is caring. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, another question I just wanted to ask you, this is concerning the Suno AI. We just talked mm -hmm. to, uh, with you that there are some services that are generating lyrics, even music for you. And it somehow reminds me the situation with autotune, autotune. When people were studying using that, a lot of musicians say, no singing right now. This is kind of, you don't need to have voice and you don't need to have some skill, singing skills. But now like 20 years or even more of using of the tune, well, more, yeah, definitely more. So does it remind you the situation with all the uh, AI assistance right now, AI services? In a way, it's much more global, as in like it affects much more people, and it also is coming in a uh, and it's on a much deeper level. Because like there, you could basically produce a part of the song with much less effort. Now you can get a whole piece with practically zero effort. So it's just, but the same thing applies as well. There's a bit of a. a a bit of a moral panic with people going like, oh my God, music will be dead because auto-tune, like no one will be a good singer anymore, all that stuff. But what ended up happening, like we still have amazing singers. I think most of the pop stars we have nowadays are actually have amazing vocal talents. Like some of them have literally superhuman abilities when, when it comes to singing. And auto-tune has been you around. Talking about, it didn't by change the way. Uh, well, about that, that's like Mariah Carey and Ariana Grande. They have, they basically have crazy vocal ranges and can go into this really yeah. high whistle register thing. And apparently, dolphins really love it, which is kind of strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they literally <laughs> react to it, I guess, because it's a closer to their frequency range, the the one they're m more comfortable uh, communicating with. And have you heard this song from? Drake and Weekend? Well, it's not really AI generated. I think it was actually... So I think the beat was downloaded from a like a beat repository site. Basically, well, artists upload their beats for everyone else to use. And it's normally covered by some kind of license, like Creative Commons or something. Basically, it's always very permissive, so you can use it just as you would use any other sound, like as if you recorded it yourself, pretty much. So, anyways, he used a, ready, uh, a beat, a uh, uh, already pre pre recorded beat, wrote the lyrics himself, sang uh, himself, and then they used the voice change AI to change the time of his voice to sound more like Drake or The Weeknd. So the lyrics was uh, manually written. It wasn't Maybe, uh, I, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Maybe it was chat GPT or something. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But Sound even with the lyrics, it, it, yeah. maybe. But if, actually with the lyrics, that, that's a good point. Like the Drake, fake Drake's verse, doesn't really sound like Drake. Like kind of like it, it. I don't know. I can't really put my finger on it, but it's like it's missing something. It's not him. Same thing, like with the weekend parts. It's even more obvious. Like we, the weekend has like this very very particular way of building melodies, and it's missing there. Like with the weekend, some people joke that it's almost like a formula for him. Like because lots of his songs use the same way, the same approach to melodies. It's basically using the same note of the scale. Like they all rely on, on the on basically the second degree of the scale, 
because if you go up you kind of like make a pleasant sound with the root you go you turn into like the third which is always like pleasant sounding with the root if you go down you got the root so we and it sounds good with itself as well so anywhere you go it's a pleasant interval and you can just stay in that notes interval forever and just like good position <laughs> yeah it, it works and it sounds very effective it sounds very catchy like all these melodies are very simple but they just get stuck in your mind <laughs> that's true there's a kind of music repetition <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> repetition. Yeah, and you know Oliver Sacks has a very interesting book, uh, w which is called "Music of Phil," "Music of Philly." Yeah, uh, "Music of Philia." Uh, yeah, "Music of Philia." Oh, "Music of Philia." I'm not sure about the stress there. <laughs> something, something close to this. Yeah. This is about the love to music. <laughs> uh -huh. So here it is. He's writing about very interesting uh cases as a psychiatrist as a neuro neuroscientist he is uh, kind of studying and researches the cases where which are connected with the music for example some people just woke up with the music in their head and they it never stopped and which is interesting it started with the like uh, diversified uh, diversified track right with the beginning and with the with the culminative and with the conclusion but in the end there's uh, these people who had such issue they at the end of their life they only hear uh, heard one note so just one but just one note and okay. it uh, dro drove them crazy so because before <laughs> that it was their favorite tracks for most of them it was some kind of the music which was connected ah, with some emotional okay. yeah with some emotional um feelings which were experienced mm -hmm. probably while listening to this music and after some kind of the stress activities or any other any other um, like negative context people start starting having this music worms that's why i just uh, remembered about this so for everyone who is who is interested in how our brain uh, is reacting to the music itself so i really really recommend to to read it yeah it's it's fascinating and as actually uh, in conclusion i would like to ask you the following question which is quite hot right now <laughs> mm -hmm. so how the industry the music industry uh, would be changed to your mind when we have uh, like all of the AI assistance and generative music on a bigger scale would it separate the generative music from the human uh, human written one Mm, I don't think it will separate it per se, but there might come a separation. That's quite a big possibility. I mean, uh, even nowadays with what we see on streaming services is people tend to seek functional music. And with functional music, you kind of, uh, you want the same but different, but still the same, you know? So applying generative mo models there is quite uh, possible for like what functional do you mean stuff by like functional that. music as in uh, as, as i mentioned earlier a music designed to serve a function it's either like how it is with us with Andrew, we tr help you focus sleep relax but then you have like things like i don't know, dial tone music like you call your bank and they play you music while you're on hold so you don't really notice how long you're on hold problem is if it starts repeating too much, as in like you finish the track and it's played again and again and again, you actually become much more aware of how much time has passed. Yeah. So applying some kind of a generative music stream that it just generates sounds for you with not stopping, not repeating too much will definitely help you lose that sense of time much easier. So like not, not notice time passing. So those are prime examples for this. At the same time, I don't think it will kill recorded music in any way. Like, we still rely too much on our emotional connection with the artist when listening to music. Like, we, even nowadays, we have, uh, I don't know, ghostwriters who write the songs for the artists, but 
it's still the the performer themselves that has, has to sell it. And until we get rid of that, we'll still have real life pop stars and everything. We kind of do have fake, like not AI po uh, pop stars, but fake, well, not fake, but imaginary pop stars. So a notable example, well, we, even just a good example is Gorillaz. For quite a long time, it was just a virtual band with live people playing the concerts and kind of like an open secret of it being Dave Albin and of oh, Damon Albin and uh, lots of collaborators. Um, so, yeah, and even it's, it's kind of funny because like on old Gorillaz albums that it wouldn't even uh, credit the people who would uh, were featured on that tracks quite often. So. So it would be separated, right? Yeah, it kind of would be. I think it would be separated. Yeah, but not because the process itself will make it separate. It's just because we'll suddenly have a better tool. Like instead of making human musicians write that boring elevator music, we'll just get human musicians to train the network to write that boring elevator music. Thing is, even then, like training a general uh, network would be so expensive for the regular consumer that probably we'll see a rise of much smaller, much more niche, much more user-oriented networks that will help user generate. So maybe we'll have something that just doesn't even generate sounds, to generate chords for you, plays them through a synth with, I don't know, like uh, some basic neural network that chooses the most pleasant sounding preset for that send for these notes. And that's going to be your whole oh, come on, dial tone, dial, uh, like weight music. Mm -hmm. And that could work as well. Uh, I, what I'm really excited about is how people are going to use it creatively, like how people are going to try and express themselves in new ways. A good, like you mentioned autotune before, like autotune turned into a very, um, I don't know, a very, a very bright instrument in a way. Like when you, when the vocalist chooses to use autotune, that conveys a very certain, a very culturally coded emotion and not even emotion, just vibe in general. So we'll probably see something like that with AI. There's already even albums made with AI. I think uh, Holly Herndon's uh, Proto. I think that was the name of the album. Uh, it was basically like it was basically recorded by her feeding her own audio into the network and the network transforming it and them just like going into this loop together. I mean, even nowadays, we're kind of halfway there. You could be a hip hop artist who wants to sample a drum beat for, for, from some song, but you don't want all the other instruments. You get the song, cut out the part you need, and then feed it into a stem separation tool that separates your drums and you're free to go. The music world became so much convenient for all the creators. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Creating music has cool. never been easier. Making money yeah. from music, though, <laughs> is never a whole different harder. story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's true. And in conclusion, Das, could you please name three uh, useful and uh, interesting solutions which you are using for creating music? Which, well, I don't actually use much personally, but I could recommend uh, uh, Lalalai, which is a stem separation service that works really well. Another thing people could try is the, uh, everything in the Google's test, uh, AI test kitchen. Uh, it's uh, It basically generates short loops for you, but you can use that as a very nice initial sample to build your track upon. And another one, I don't remember the maker, but it's a vocal, well, a voice processing plugin called Goyo, G-O-Y-O. Uh, it uses basically machine learning to clean up the sound of your voice. So it kind of removes extra, uh, no, remo removes ex extra noises, does de-assing, all that stuff. So kind of like smoothes your song. Yeah, brush ups your sound. So 
I would recommend those. Yes, it was such an engaging, such such a fascinating, such an interesting discussion. Thanks a lot for coming and for revealing for us uh, insights from generative music. At, at the end of our podcast, I would kindly ask you to share with us your favorite meme in music, and we will have our mimography for our podcast. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll come up with something I'll send you a bit later. Uh, thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you so much, Des, for coming. And see you soon. Mm-hmm.